Scaling Up Nation, your programs are of the highest quality. That means your products need to be that same high quality. And that's why I trust Scranton Associates to help me bring the best to my customers. They're a fourth generation business with over 100 years of experience. Scranton Associates can help you with biocides and both powder and liquid blends. If you have a question about your products, give them a call and they will help you review your formulas. They can also review your safety data sheets and labels. Folks, they know what they're doing when they're looking at these and they can prevent you from getting costly fines. Scranton Associates can handle all of your blending needs from the smallest order up to tanker cars. Find out why I trust Scranton Associates for yourself. Call them today or visit ScrantonAssociates.com. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, Scaling Up Nation. Trace Blackmore here, your host for Scaling Up H2O. And wow, all the things that are going on recently. I know they are affecting the way you do business. And that's what we're actually going to talk about today. We're going to talk uh, one to an individual that is in the water treatment industry. But before we do that, I want to talk about a question that I received, and it was about how do you better plan for your day? And this person went on to say that they got to an account, they made really good time because they left early, and then when they got there, they forgot a key piece of equipment or a tool, and that really made that visit not count because they didn't have what they needed and they had to go back. So the question was all around how could they better plan for that so you can minimize showing up without something that you need. And I, I can't help but think the seven habits of highly effective people one habit one is to be proactive that you know we make decisions we're in charge of those decisions but habit two i think really answers this question habit two is begin with the end in mind now here's what i like to do whenever i set out to do anything i will take a moment and i will mentally create that picture in my head and that allows me to walk all through that account or whatever that task is and mentally have myself go through whatever work I'm going to do and see what tools, what equipment, whatever I am going to need. And the, the mind just allows you to do that without being there. Uh, habit two goes into saying, you know, the house that you're in right now it didn't get built all of a sudden. There was a lot of planning that went into it. And before it was ever drawn on paper, it was created in someone's mind. So I like to use all of my tasks with that house metaphor. So I'm going to ask that you do that. Mentally go through your day and see what is it that you need. Now, maybe you visualize a certain account and you're going to have to change the tubing in some pumps. So you better bring the tubing. Maybe you also better bring something to cut that tubing with. And now maybe you visualize carrying that dirty, wet tubing with sodium hypochlorite in it across the customer's floor and now you bleached their floor. So now... Instead of actually going through that for real, I'm going to bring a plastic bag that I can put the tubing in so that doesn't happen. So we can make it so we don't have to make mistakes to learn from. We can actually go through all of that in our head. So that's the first way that I would answer that question is to mentally visualize what you're doing and do you have everything necessary for that. Now, I have found in working with people that most people don't do that. They just simply show up, and luckily, they might have something in their truck, but if they don't, now they've wasted time. I urge you to take an extra five or 10 minutes before you leave 
to see what you're going to need by doing that mental exercise. And folks, you could shave off hours in your week if you show up prepared. Now, this is a discipline that I learned when I would service on a regular basis. I always had a change of clothes in my car just in case I met with a client and I was filthy from servicing. Now, how did I learn that? Well, I used to have a turkey rendering plant. And folks, they use a lot of water treatment. I don't know if you've ever been to a turkey rendering plant, but it is the stinkiest place that you can ever imagine. And I planned that when I serviced that account, I always had a change of clothes and I would actually go to a nearby truck stop and shower, change clothes, and then service the rest of my route. Now, the reason that I did that is because one time I didn't really think of it and you kind of get immune to what you smell like. And while I was servicing that area, a property manager that I was trying to meet with called and said that they could meet with me that day. I was in the area that day. So I met with her and she was very polite, but I could tell that she knew that I recently came from a turkey rendering plant. So from that point on, I learned that I never knew what I was going to get into, but I needed to take the opportunity to be prepared so that way, if somebody did call me, even though I wasn't expecting them to call me, if it was opportunistic to meet with them, I didn't want to say no just because I didn't have a change of clothes. So from that point on, I always kept a change of clothes. Now, here's something that I have been taught, and I've done this for a while, and I want to share with you. I love working off of checklists. Checklists are amazing because they allow you to take that mental picture that we started talking about and now create all the items that you are going to need, and now you don't have to take up headspace anymore. All you have to do is check off the list. And then what I would do is I would keep that checklist with me and I would always alter it based on how well that day went. Well, maybe I forgot something. Maybe I brought something and the last five times I just did not need it. It was taking up a lot of room in my car. So I decided to delete that. Well, when I had the experience that I just shared with you with the property manager and the turkey rendering plant, I added that set of clothes to that list. Now, again, it was for my own well-being because I knew other people knew what the turkey rendering plant was smelling like when I would go meet with whomever if I was servicing or meeting with some sort of property professional. But I always did that, and that really helped me make the most out of the time that I had. And Nation, I just can't say enough about checklists. I do a lot of scuba dive instruction where I'm responsible for large groups of people. And if I didn't have a checklist to work off with that, I would always forget something. But checklists are your friends. There's some great books out there that talk about checklists. They're not very exciting. One is the Checklist Manifesto, and it is not the most exciting book but he talks about how they use checklists in the medical industry. And it was a very interesting read. And then what I did for my business group is I boiled that down into a presentation. I actually put that up for the Association of Water Technologies uh, papers for review for the annual convention. It did not get chosen. But folks, I just want to let you know the power of the checklist. It definitely saves headspace. So for the Scaling Up Nation member that sent in that question, thank you very much. You know, we have so many questions as water treaters, and today's guest knows exactly what I'm talking about. You see, he is a water treater. His name is John Flegg, and he's been in the water treatment industry for quite a while, and he's going to share his experience with us. Folks, you know I love interviewing water treaters on this show, so please help me welcome John Flegg. 
Scaling Up Nation, I interview a lot of people in a lot of different industries, but I got to be honest with you. My favorite interview is when I get to speak with a fellow water treater because I know what they are going through and I know you know exactly what I mean. My lab partner today is John Flegg of Kim Energy. John, how are you? I'm doing great, Trace. How are you today? I am doing very well, and I am excited to talk about all things water treatment and how you do what you do in the water treatment industry. Great. Sounds like a plan. Well, let's start with you introducing yourself to the water treatment industry, and more importantly, the Scaling Up Nation. So who is John Flegg? Yeah, that's a good question. My wife's trying to figure that out, too. So and, uh, about a month ago, on Cinco de Mayo, I celebrated my 29th birthday, uh, but it was my 31st time doing it, whatever. So that gives your viewers like how old I am and uh, how long I've been in the water treatment industry. I basically been in the industry probably about 35 years uh, now, maybe even a little bit longer. I sort of lost track, if you will. Uh, not a bad thing. I love the industry. I love the freedom that's involved with the industry. And if you're in business for yourself, your business really is your life. So, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, I think of my business as a man cave. I enjoy it. It's not a big deal coming here and uh, whatever. I wouldn't be anywhere else. So, Well, somebody once said, and I don't remember the quotes or who did the quote, but if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Right. And that works for me. You said you've been in the business for 35 years. I'm curious, how did you get into the water treatment industry? You have to sort of follow along, and I'll try to be brief. My junior year in high school, and I'm trying to give a year, so that would have been 1977. My uncle had a boiler repair business. Actually, he got his start with Cleaver Brooks Boilers, and he went out on his own. So he had a boiler repair business, and uh, in my junior year, I worked there during the summer. Well, back in 1977, everybody wasn't on gas or if you were way out in the woods on propane or whatever, well, maybe they were, but most people were on like a number four or even a number six oil that, uh, you know, even smaller places, you know, commercial places, their boiler rooms were running on oil. So during that summer of my junior year, I worked for him. After that, in my senior year, Everybody asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I was going to work for my uncle, which I was. He asked me to work for him full time right out of uh, high school and, you know, sort of apprenticeship and uh, so on and so forth. So I did that. But the problem was it was a great opportunity. But after about four or five months and being sooted up like a chimney sweeper every day, day in and out, and I was the low man on totem pole, it was like, yeah, I don't think I really like that. So um, so I left that and I ticked around a little. I always liked photography. So I ended up getting a photography diploma. So I was doing that. But back then, my dad worked on the railroad and actually had a small distributorship of Dearborn Aquaserve stuff, which if you think about it, it was tying into my uncle's boiler business to get us customers. Well, I sort of knew about his stuff. I used to read, I don't know if anybody, your listeners remembers Dearborn used to have these big, massive training manuals with, I think they called it their Cyclomax, uh, a couple other things. And they were pretty cool to read. I had no idea why I read them, but I did. And I thought it was cool probably because my dad did it. And so I sort of had this little, very basic idea of what he did. But as it turned out, he ended up, uh, he lives, so it's it's not a bad story, but he had a heart attack. So he couldn't get around to his monthly customers. And to make a long story short, I was like, okay, I'll go. So I didn't really have any training other than reading. And maybe he trained me a little, but that's sort of how I got my start. He, he basically had a heart attack. Nobody could service his accounts. We didn't want to lose the accounts. So I went out and did them. I remember my first account, and you probably remember this because it was in our area, but they sold nationwide, was White Mop Ringer. But I remember going in there, and I mean, you talk about somebody nervous. I don't even know if I had eye contact except with the ground, and I was just praying, praying that nobody would ask me like a technical question. 
that's how I got my start. So it, it was pretty uh, interesting. But when you look back on everything, you know, everybody has a story to tell, which is sort of neat and uh, whatever. So now here's a funny thing. So ask me how much I made per week back then. Well, I'm curious, how much did you make back then? $50. So $50 a week back then. I told myself, probably one of the smartest things I did as a youngster, I said, instead of analyzing it every day and every night and saying, oh, this is wrong with it, that's wrong with it, you know, because you can pick out what's wrong with stuff if you want to. I said, you know what? I'll give it a year. And after a year, I'll sit down with myself and decide whether I like it. So I remember it was like a year and a half or two years before I even realized that the year was up. So evidently, I liked it. But going back to that $50 thing, I held out and I tell the story that I got my dad really good. And I was the worthwhile employee because he came back with an offer that I did accept. And it was for $51 a week. <laughs> Well, I guess your alternative was to go back to work for your uncle and get black lung. Right, exactly, exactly. And you know, back then they, you, you mentioned that. I remember the first time, I mean, he said, hey, you want a painter's mask? And I'm like, what, what are you in your junior years? 15, 16, I don't know, whatever. And I said, no, I'll be all right. And he was like, you sure? They didn't have OSHA stuff back then. They He had a painter's mask, you know, make sure you pinch it, whatever. I didn't want it. So for the next few days, I was spitting up. It tasted like a rusty nail and blowing my nose with soot. And so after that, I'm sure I used it. And uh, when you're young and you're a kid, you're trying to prove yourself. So you're jumping right into it. But for our public service announcement, always wear your PPE now, right? Exactly. Even more so. You know, when I remember years ago when I used to go into a compressor room, you know, and I was like, I didn't have those ear things then. And People started wearing them. I said, no, you know, whatever. Knock on wood, it didn't really affect me. If anything, it was probably my headphones and my stereo that have affected me. But you're absolutely right. PPE stuff, and uh, you never know. Yeah, my dad actually had some hearing loss in the uh, high pitch areas because of dealing with chillers all his life. He couldn't hear certain tones. Yeah, I, and I believe it. And I probably can't hear my wife's tone. I think that's genetics, though. I don't think you can blame that on water treatment. Well, you told us about how you got started. What does your current day-to-day -day look like? I'm an early riser. I'm like one of these guys that goes to sleep by 8.30 at night and wonders why he wakes up at 2.30 in the morning. You know, I should really think about that scheduling. And uh, But I'm normally at work at 6 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 5.45. Yeah, I'm in the office at 6. I do sort of my stuff. You know, as you know, when you say if you have five employees, there's a lot to do, you know, behind the scenes work, signing checks, doing this, doing that, the pro projects that you're trying to complete, you know, for the company, uh, we're trying to move along, you know, and we're doing it slowly, like with 5S and different things. And I know other people have other things, but 5S really does it for us. For the audience, uh, describe 5S. Well, that's more or less like keep it simple, keep it clean. And really go back and look at your processes to make sure you haven't cluttered them up. So in other words, so your workbench, do you really need five hammers? Should the workbench sort of be organized so the hammers are maybe right where you think you're going to need them? As a smaller company, as you know, we all wear a lot of hats. You know, at 9 o'clock, we may be doing this. At 10 o'clock, we may be doing that. Maybe from 11 to 3, we're... We're, you know, out with the customer doing that. Then when you come back, you do uh, quotes. So so that would probably be my typical. I mean, I don't know where the day goes, but it goes. So it's, uh, it seems like it's six. My guys normally come in at seven, you know, between seven and eight, depending on what they go and do. They're pretty self-sufficient. I mean, we meet and the fun term is to do a daily huddle in today's world. That's the Vern Harnish way and talk about things. But, you know, we're a small enough company that, you know, it's not like I'm high up in a penthouse where nobody can see me. I mean, we see each other a lot during the day. You know what I mean? To say, hey, what about this? What about that? You mentioned Vern Harnish. I'm curious. Are you a fan of the Rockefeller habits? Oh, yeah. I think that's a good way to, uh, 
you know, have a mission statement, you know, like a 90 day mission statement. I don't know if your viewers know about Vern Harness, but he's very good with scaling up. And again, that's taking some smaller companies. And it depends what you think about a smaller company. A smaller company in today's world could be $2 million. It doesn't mean like it's $200,000. I think years ago when I was younger, that was a smaller company. Uh, but a smaller company still can be $2 million or something like that. But where you take it, you get organized. And he has his methods. You have He, he has his daily huddle. You have a theme every 90 days. So, hey, what are we going to work on this month? Are we going to do the five S's? Are we going to try to be neat and clean for the next, you know, 90 days for the next three months? Do we feel like our sales are not where they should be? Should we really put a, uh, you know, fun sales thing together? So and uh, we try to keep it fun here at Chem Energy, like a lot of people do. What are some of the ways that you try to keep work fun? Probably those 90 days where we do themes. A couple of times we've done Star Wars theme. A couple of times during the winter. We've done different themes and bought in some large inflatable things that outsiders would look and say, what the heck are those for? I don't know. I guess those, you know, are just some of it. And, uh, and, and I guess part of fun is not putting a lot of pressure on it and sort of trusting it instead of um, the other thing I don't really do is micromanage. You know what I mean? So it's like, hey, it. And for, for lack of better terms, though, those goals we set up during our themes, we tend to hit them. You know what I mean? I think it tends to be when we get serious that we don't hit our goals. So we're in, in our minds, we're going through a little, I wouldn't call it a sales slump, but we've got, um, you know, more out there that's uh, normally we get one out of two at least. Well, you have gotten the Scaling Up Nation extremely curious. We all want to know how you incorporate Star Wars and sales goals. How do you do that? I can't remember if we figured out to, as a group, have a Star Wars day uh, where we w went out to eat for lunch. And then we all went to the movies to see Star Wars and enjoy it like that. But it probably was something related to a sales goal. And just having fun with it. I might have even bought in uh, Star Wars figures that I gave away. And, and I can't remember exactly how we did it, but it was more geared to having fun. So, you know what I mean? So it's uh, we might even bought in some laser stuff and uh, whatever. So I, I probably really should do it. And in fact, I think we did a couple of James Bond things, you know, so that had to be a while ago where we went to that. And, uh, and then I know we did Iron Man. So... I, I don't know. I like to get everybody together and into the movies. We all get along good. And, and you know, the, the day goes by quick and your guys hustle, we hustle. And sometimes you need a little break from the hustle, if you will. So and to, to, to recharge your batteries. I love it. That's great. John, what do you think is something that you do better than anybody else? I, I'm just me. But a lot of people say that I'm more of an optimist. You know, so what would that be? The glass is half full all the time. So um, and more of a rooter of people instead of putting them down, rooter as in cheering them on. Sometimes people say I'm pretty good at a coach. Actually, I used to coach. I used to coach up to Legion Baseball. Well, now knowing that you're a coach, I can definitely see that in what you post on social media. I can definitely see that coach inside you. I'm curious, why did you start posting on social media? And specifically, you post on LinkedIn. Yeah, and you probably don't know, but I also do Instagram too. Inst LinkedIn, I don't know a lot about all this stuff. And you know what? I, I decided, you know, a lot of times... If you want to learn something, you know, you you read a book, you, you really explore it, and then you really, like, maybe go to an expert. I didn't really want to do all that stuff because it's like sales. I, I don't know in sales if you ever took the IBM sales selling course. I think everybody did. After a while, you know what? I chucked it. I, I mean, I used some of the principles, but I really believe you have to be your own self. But going back to to LinkedIn. Thank you for saying I, I coach because I try to root people on, let them have a little laugh, if you will, uh, show them that it can be done. And I realize sometimes if you watch it on LinkedIn, and even more so if you watch it on Instagram, can I mention on Inst 
Instagram what my thing is or handle? Not that it matters. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. It's Johnny Chemicals. It's a little bit different on Instagram. I try to have a little bit more fun with that because I think LinkedIn is is very good and you can have fun, but it's different than Instagram. So, I mean, I just picked that up by the vibe of it, if you will. Um, the reason we did it is we have always talked about it. We've, you know, back in the day, it was like, like I, I bet you eight or nine years ago, we set up some of those accounts and it was like, oh, let's get somebody to like us. Let's get somebody to like us. Yeah, that's cool. But, but it's not really a sale. You know what I mean? But if you're getting somebody on the first base, if you will, of doing business with your company, I think a lot of these things can help, just like LinkedIn. Now, believe it or not, we have a couple different distributors that signed up with us from LinkedIn. We've got some stuff possibly going through Instagram, which is pretty neat. But I think what I did it, one, we had said we wanted to do it for a long time. So that's why I started posting uh, on it, you know, because I felt we needed to get our information out there, especially the solids. You know, we're not here to talk about the solids or whatever, or, or you know, prime nap pump or whatever. So, but I do think that's the future. And believe it or not, solids have been around for 20 years. Now, other people say, yeah, it is what it is, but, it, and it doesn't matter. But so I, I try to promote the solids out there, promote water treatment. I personally like equipment. When I walk in and see a boiler working, and sometimes, even though you can't be nosy, and in today's world, you have non-compete agreements, I like to see how machinery works, how they do stuff. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. That is the best part about our job. It's like we go to work with our own private How Is It Made TV show. Right, exactly. And that's one of my favorite TV shows. Well, John, I'm curious, how do you learn new things after being in the business for 35 plus years? Well, you know, you sort of, after a while, you feel that you're like falling behind. You know what I mean? If, if, if you do let yourself go that far. So I guess I'm a reader. I like to read stuff, books. I try to skim over stuff. It's just a habit. To learn new things, you even have to look at other industries. I guess that's somehow what I do. Not even to just say, hey, what's going on with the water treatment industry? Hey, what's going on with the pot potable water treatment industry that may affect the water treatment industry? You know, a lot, a lot of people our way now are, in, and I'm not quite into them yet, are going to a lot of monochloramine machines, you know, for Legionella and so on and so forth in potable water systems. And it's just interesting. Years ago, I remember, and I'm sure you were there, maybe you were the president, um, when AWT had their grand old Opry, right? They were there. Were they only there once or was has it been there more than once and had their annual convention there? Uh, we have been in Nashville twice that I could remember. One, I think, was like 2003, 2004, and then again just a couple of years ago. All right. Probably way back. So 2003, 2004, and it was interesting. I remember... I was out and, you know, my ears perked up because I think it was nothing wrong with it. One of the best guys I was either talking to or he, he was right next to us. He said, oh, yeah, we're going to have a uh, deionization machine on every boiler. And, uh, you know, that's our goal. And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting goal. So, you know, just by listening sometimes. So what did I do? I was like, hmm, could that really happen? And I was like, hmm. I don't know if it really can happen because by the time you're doing all that deionization stuff, you're going to need more chemicals to feed the deionization, you know, unless he was talking about e-cells. But I, I, I think those are too costly to put in. And uh, that's how I learn new things. I mean, just really paying attention to other things. And I don't know, I guess at my age, it's like my kids are grown up. Uh, I had two boys and uh, knock on wood, I was very lucky when they were young that I was always there for everything, whether it be a birthday party or whatever. I may have to go to work after they went to bed, but when they were young and growing up, now they're older. They, you know, at least one of them's, you know, going to have two kids or whatever and probably take this over. It, it, it's funny. It, it was it was never really a job to me. You know what I mean? So if it's never really a job, you know, and sometimes it drives you crazy, you eat, breathe, sleep it, you know, and 
not in those words, you know what I mean. So it's like, you're always thinking about water treatment. I can definitely relate with that. Well, now let's put your 35 plus years experience to use with the Scaling Up Nation. So what do you think every water treater should know? So what's a water treatment tip you can share with the Scaling Up Nation? Well, I don't know if it's a water treatment tip, but (laughs) it's like, I would say to put your customer's needs in front of your needs. You know what I mean? So if, if they're willing to buy the biggest, you know, XYZ electronic component and you know darn well that they don't need it and don't want it, you know. So I've learned that over the years and knock on what I thought I was pretty good at that, you know, being sort of transparent because those same people that you sort of say, hey, I appreciate maybe you giving me that big sale, but I'm not really sure if you really need it, you know. They end up looking good in front of their bosses. You look good in front of them. The other tip, which isn't a a tip, but this is what I've learned, you know, years ago that when I used to do steam boilers and, you you know, you'd go out on a day of testing a steam boiler without a softener back in the day. And my test kit used to be grungy, you know, at the end of the day. You're the professional. And even sometimes I find you ask me what my day to day is. Almost every other day, I'm cleaning out my test kit, you know, making sure it looks good, making sure my my Rinnell or my Pixis or whatever I'm using, my 890 hack um, is looking nice and spiffy. So when the customer is, you know, talking to me, I do look like the professional. You know what I mean? Not some guy who threw himself together 10 minutes before I got on the job and said, hey, do this, do this. And. I am right there with you. There is so much that goes with taking care of your equipment. Not only does the customer see you as a professional, when you're keeping it nice and well kept and calibrated and new batteries and all that stuff, you're getting better results so you can make better decisions. Right. And and you're right. There you go with the better results. That's even more than I even thought of. Right. To make better decisions. How many times have we all taken a conductivity reading and uh, whatever and didn't have calibration solution. And it's like, oh my God, the roof is falling. Well, in fact, the roof wasn't falling. Uh, you know, you like you said, maybe you needed new batteries or something. Yeah, we even have a procedure here where every week we'll wash our glassware. And I have worked with other water treaters that I don't think they have done that process for 10 years. It's their favorite flask and it's maybe their lucky flask too, and they're not going to wash any of the luck off of it. Well, now you're talking directly to the brand new water treater. What advice do you want to give them? You know, I was a brand new water treater, you know, 30 some years ago. I was green. I had all sorts of things going through my head, which is absolutely fantastic. You know, what's the thing? Dream it, believe it, and then do it or something like that. Hey, whether or not you're an athlete, a water treater, I mean, you have to dream big. You have to work at your craft, you know, like Stephen Covey. I think he was the one in his seven habits or whatever, sharpen the saw. I think that was one of them. That was habit seven. Right, exactly. And I love that. So that's one of the things to do in water treatment. And I think probably, if I may say another one, the other one would be a new water treater to be good at communication. You know what I mean? So sometimes when you're young, you're dealing with older people. Now I'm sort of the older people. You know what I mean? When people deal with me, but I, I'm pretty easygoing and, uh, you know, I want younger people to get involved with the industry. So I think a lot of people, uh, you know, think water treatment is blase. Well, l- look at what we cover. One, I know about injection molding. I know a whole bunch of stuff. I remember, I don't know if they sell it your way, but there, around our way, there used to be a Troy built factory, which made like lawnmowers and their big thing was rototillers and stuff. He showed me the whole thing. It showed me how they did their gears, how it was on like an assembly line, how it went through a spray booth, how they popped on their tires as it's going by. I mean, to me, that's pretty neat stuff. But in, in, in any event, the other thing would be, like I said, communication skills. If you can learn to communicate with people and give them what they want, you know, that's the old saying, give people what they want and you'll get what you want. And, and it doesn't have to be devious or anything like that. 
And guess what? You, you're not going to get rich in, in two months or three months or a year or whatever. So, But if you slowly get customers and get them on your side, little by little, the word does get around that, hey, this guy's a pretty good water treater. This gal's a pretty good water treater. Because, you know, that whole industry has changed. You know, 1977, very hard to find a woman in the business. And God bless them. They should be in the business now. And they should have been then. So if you're a young person listening, so, you know, keep at it. Don't expect to get rich right away. I don't know. And, and hone your craft, if you will. So which means being able to talk to somebody and not bamboozle them. If that's still a word, I don't know. It's still a word. And all of that was great advice. So thanks for sharing that. Now, I am curious. You've you've been around, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, for over 35 years. What is something that you continuously see water treaters do? And you now have a platform of 10,000 water treaters that you are talking to. What do you want them to stop doing? Boy, this is going to hurt because I, I see some installations. And on LinkedIn, you know, we just actually, I think I just posted and, and we took over an account and it's like, you just got to knock off the sloppiness. You know what I mean? At, at the end of the day, if your installation isn't pretty much perfect, you should take another 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I can tell you that probably over the course of my uh, career, which hopefully will keep God willing going or whatever, because I don't know what else to do, I can get accounts by walking into an account that is sloppy and messy and the pumps are leaking and whatever. We actually carry around paper towels and cleaner to sort of clean up and, you know, it, some factories are factories, you know, in a day you're going to have dust on them. You know what I mean? It is what it is. But commercial accounts, it's like, you know, you're talking real estate agents and, you know, real estate management groups, they're not used to dirt and stuff. They just like it nice and clean. And, uh, you know, I just see it. I'm not saying I see it nationally, but hey, if you close the door, close the barn door before you leave, which means keeping it nice and clean, talking to your customer before you leave, almost making sure everything's going the right way. If you do that, then you know what? The next month you come in, there won't be any surprises. No, I, I love that. I I definitely agree with you uh, with exactly what you said. And that's that's one of my pet peeves is when people think they're saving time, it's always costing them time. In fact, I've got a friend who's an engineer and he says, you better have time to do things right the first time or you better make time to do it right the next time. So, John, during this interview, we've covered a lot of topics. What is the one thing that you want to make sure the Scaling Up Nation gets from our interview? If you like water treatment, do it for the love of it. The money will come. And I realize people have bills. Maybe they're a brand new parent or whatever or something. I, I get all that. I, you know, I, I was married to, you know, I bought my first car, you know, it was like my girlfriend dumped me right afterwards because I went from a 69 Camaro to a van and both of them were used. So it wasn't like flashy and new. And then to be practical, to do all my service accounts, I bought a Ford Escort. So what a chick mobile. You know, you can't get more sexy than a Ford Escort. I think that's the only car that had white smoke coming out of it when it was actually off. Exactly. That and the Vega. So I had them both. But I don't know. It's, it's probably Rome is not built in a day. And I realize that we all read a book. You know what I mean? And, and even though the book doesn't say get rich quick, it's like they want you to read the book and boom, you, you know, my life will change in 50 some seconds. You know, there's plenty of stuff that I've read is like cherish the journey. You know what I mean? So theoretically, you really are a success when you try to be successful. You know what I mean? Success can't be, oh, I want to have a million dollars in the bank. Well, it can be. that That's anybody's own business. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that. That's people's own business. But it's it's that's something that you're looking forward to. There's a lot of successful people that, you know, they have money, but they might not have a million dollars in the bank or whatever, and they are darn happy and they wouldn't want to be anywhere else in their life. So I guess Rome wasn't built in a day. Keep at it. 
give it, use my silly thing where I said, if you're a new water treater, instead of judging it this week and saying, oh, this week was terrible and, you know, this guy didn't like me or whatever, take a whole year to, to, to really judge the water treatment industry. You'll be surprised that in a year, you'll figure out that you probably only know 2% of what you really should know. And if I were young, you know, once you realize that you are going to stay, you know, in the water treatment industry, I would definitely go get AWT certified. And then I would promote the heck out of it. Don't just say, hey, I'm a water treater. Say, hey, I'm certified. I went through all this stuff. Great advice. I love it. Well, John, this has been a lot of fun. And I'm sure I could probably talk to you for another hour, but I know you've got some things you've got to get to. I do want to ask you a few lightning round questions if you're up for it. Okay, sure. Cool. All right. So you now have the ability to go back in time. I told you I was a Back to the Future fan. So I brought the DeLorean over to you. We've set the time circuits back to your very first day as a water treater. We get it up to 88 miles an hour. The time circuits fire, and we see your former self on your first day as a water treater. What advice would you give yourself? Wow. I was probably shaking. I was probably green. And I would probably tell myself, which I probably did, but not in this way. Relax. You've got this. So, because eventually I did. It took a while and uh, whatever to get through the day. But, you know, as we all know, that makes you a better person. All right. So I'm curious. You've mentioned several books that I've read. I'm curious, what are the last few books that you've read? I like two books that I, I really like, and I sort of keep them because I keep going back to them. I've seen certain movies a bunch of times, and there's only two or three movies that I've done that to. You know what I mean? Die Hard. I remember seeing that in some other movies. I'm a big fan of Bob Proctor. I mean, everybody knows who Tony Robbins is and everything. And I did the Tony Robbins thing to try to get better. Or, you know, you're always trying to get better. I don't know. I admit it. So I'm just, I do. But Bob Proctor had this whole thing about, hey, if it's in your subconscious, it comes out. You know what I mean? If you can't, you got to put it in your subconscious. So he's got a book that is called You Were Born Rich by Bob Proctor. Yeah, I always go back to that. There's just like six different chapters and it's just a lot of mind stuff. The other one that, which is an old classic, you know, is Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. I mean, there's just so much stuff in that book. I mean, you know, you got to have something to give to other people, whether you're a water treater or something else, or there's no need for that interaction to happen. Those are the two books that I tend to recycle and sort of keep reading and go from there. But there, recently I read The Miracle Equation by Hal Elrond, and that's, that's a very good book. That really talks about unwavering faith plus extraordinary effort. Sometimes if you go through a rough patch or whatever, you, you may need that. But that's just a book I happen to like. There's so many out there. Well, it sounds like a great reading list you just gave us. I am also a fan of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And it was it was written many, many years ago. It's still valid today. And as a matter of fact, it's on my scaling up reading list. I have actually heard of schools that are teaching that in school. And I just think that's, that's incredible. I know there's uh, some dated language in there, so some schools might shy away from that. But it, there is so much information in that, and it is timeless. So I agree with you 100%. And, and fun fact, uh, you mentioned Die Hard. That's one of the movies I watch every year. That's one of my wife and I's Christmas movies. We watch that every Christmas. Isn't that so funny? My wife and I, th this theater is now torn down. We went to it, I remember, on a Friday night. And I think that was one of the longer movies where back then maybe a movie was an hour and 45 minutes. And I think this one was like two hours and a half. And we were like, we both looked at each other like, wow, was that movie good? You know, it was just like it had you enthralled throughout the whole thing, if you will. Well, and the best part, there was a BAC cooling tower. It might have been a Marley, but I think it was a BAC. And there is a Lakewood controller in the scene. Speaking of movies, eventually Hollywood is going to hear your story and they are going to write a script about your life. Who plays you? I like Die Hard. I like Bruce Willis. He was awesome in that movie. But I also like Iron Man. 
I guess Robert Downey Jr., Jr., but as Iron Man, not as Sherlock Holmes or whatever. All right. My final question is you now have the ability to go throughout history and talk with anybody you wish to talk to. Who would it be with and why? Uh, you, you know, I'm not a history guy per se, and I try to get better as I get older. But I have always loved a comeback story. Now, the comeback story that I really like and it's funny, I am going to London this Thursday for the Yankees and Red Sox game. And, and believe it or not, a week before I made that plan, a hopefully a future distributor of our solid stuff called us about some stuff. And uh, so I'm going to meet him when I get over there, too. But was Winston Churchill. Uh, you know, he was basically shunned by the, the British government, his government. He made some massive mistakes and he basically got excommunicated by them and then they brought him back in you know when Hitler started making trying to make his move and he really saved his country who knows he might have saved western civilization you know they had invaded and took over so i like him the big thing i do like is that after his win you know against germany or whatever uh nazi germany i should say he did some commencement speaking and it was further later on during his life. And he walked up in commencement speeches and, you know, commencement speeches, it's like, uh, okay, what, what, what did you say now? Well, I guess he walked up there and I tried to buy, find the video on YouTube, but he had a cigar in his mouth. He had a cane, walked up, put the cigar down and he went into the mic and was like, never give up. And then there was a silence and he said, Never give up. Then he put his cigar back in his mouth and walked off the podium. That was it. So I thought that was awesome. And and maybe that's something for your water treaters. Hey, you will fail if you give up. If you never give up, you, you can fail. So, and uh, yeah, so, but he's somebody I do admire. There's, there's other people, but there's just something about him. He, he could have, you know, just folded up and called his life quits, but he didn't. Well, you and I share him as a hero. In fact, when Mark Lewis interviewed me on this show, that was the same answer that I gave. You and I have a lot of similarities in common, it sounds like. Well, John, I want to thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O and sharing the many years of experience that you have. I have no doubt you have motivated many a water treater in the Scaling Up Nation. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Trace. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for your great, awesome show. John, thanks again for coming on Scaling Up H2O. I love the information that you were sharing with the Scaling Up Nation. And folks, I gotta tell you, I love interviewing people. It is a, a passion of mine that I found that I had after I started the podcast. Everybody has a story. And if you just take a second to learn a little bit about someone's story, you just never know what they're going to tell you. And I remember when I started out in business and I would meet water treaters that had been in the industry for a while, I felt very intimidated to ask them to share their experiences. And I think we all have a little bit of that. We all have this mental dialogue with ourselves and we convince ourselves that there's no reason for that person to help us out, to answer that question, to take time to even talk to me. Well, folks, I can't help but be reminded by what Reed Hutchison said in episodes 122 and 123, and he said that our job is to ask, not to answer. It's the other person's job to give that answer, but so many times we don't ask the question because we've already answered for the person we were gonna ask, and the answer was no. Well, folks, give them the opportunity to answer. I think most times you are going to be surprised that they are going to answer yes. You know, on episode 115, Jeff Henderson reminded us not to just ask, but to ask big because somebody might actually answer big. So folks, don't get caught in that trap where we have that internal mental dialogue that the person isn't going to help us out. They're not going to talk to us. They're not going to share an experience. And I tell you, I have found that water treaters, especially 
love to help other people. So regardless of how long that person has been in the industry, I am fairly certain that they would love to help you out with an issue and tell you about a specific experience that mirrors probably what you're going through right now. So your job is to ask the question and their job is to answer it. And I can't help but thinking all the things that I have learned because I did not give into that mental dialogue. I actually asked the question and they gave me a great answer. And folks, I've developed some great mentors in that industry because I did not let that internal dialogue stop me. You know, I actually met John Flagg on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, I think, is the primary social media site that most water treaters connect in. I know I get asked quite a bit, where do I get the most traction for our podcast? And most definitely, it's through LinkedIn. Next week, I'm going to share some tips that I received at a podcasting conference that I attended, and there was a breakout session on LinkedIn. And the person was speaking about tips that they do that really helps them have a very professional LinkedIn page, but also it helped them grow their connections. And I know we're all trying to do that. Whenever we give somebody a business card or let them know who we are and what we do, the first thing that people do now is they go straight to social media and they try to figure out what they can figure out about us. So ask yourself, if one of your clients or potential clients did that, what would they learn about you? And is that the message you want them to learn? Is that the impression that you want to give? So next week's show, we're going to be talking all about that. My hope is that it will give you a few tips that will help you engage your current and your future customers. Until then, I hope you all have a great week and I'll talk to you next week on Scaling Up H2O. Nation, one of the keys of my success has been being a member of groups of people that help me get to the next level. Let's face it, when we are bombarded with the day-to-day -day of all of these tasks that we have to do in our job, it is so easy for us not to work on the things that we decided were most important to us. We work on things that are most important to other people. The Rising Tide Mastermind is a group that will make sure that you're considering all of the items that are available to you and making sure that you are getting to the next level. Simply put, you will get where you want to go faster when you have a group of people that are encouraging you and keeping you accountable to get there. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to see if this is the right group for you.